Are you looking to get on the road to your dream career? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Mentor Select Podcast with your host, Derek Phillips. Always stay up to date on social media at Mentor Select and online at MentorSelect.com. Here's your host of the Mentor Select Podcast, Derek Phillips. Welcome to episode 42 of the Mentor Select Podcast. It is always a pleasure to have you join us. We really appreciate it. If you have not had a chance to like, subscribe, and review the Mentor Select Podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform, please do so because all of that support helps the Mentor Select Podcast reach more people and just provide them with that quality virtual mentorship that our guest mentors provide every week. Uh, It's been a really good week for me. I launched my book, Poverty Powerball, last Friday, and the reception has been phenomenal. Just been blown away by how many people have supported me through buying a book, through sharing my posts on social media, and just also providing me reviews on Amazon for the book. I just can't thank you all enough. It's been really great. It feels really good being a published author. And a lot of doors are already starting to open up as a result. Yesterday, I did an interview for Provoke Magazine, which is a local magazine here in Dallas. I'll certainly let you know the details once that uh, issue is released. And also, I have an event coming up at the end of the month where I'll be speaking at a school in Kentucky. But I'll give you all more details on that. But that's a really ex- exciting opportunity. I can't wait to give you the, the details for that opportunity. Um, today we have our guest mentor is Larry Hawkins, and he's a co-founder and CEO of Hawkins Development Group, which is a consulting firm in Austin, Texas. But they do consulting all around the United States and really all around the world. So during this interview, Larry shares with us how he went from being a electrical engineer by trade to helping people and organizations find self-fulfillment, and discover their purpose. So that's a really exciting transition. And Larry has a very inspirational story. So you're really going to enjoy this interview. So let's get to it. Today we have Larry Hawkins on the Mentor Select Podcast. How are you, Larry? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing awesome. It's finally warming up here in Dallas. It's been cold all week, so I'm excited (laughs) about that. Yeah, You're in Austin, right? Right. Okay. Well, glad to be here today. Certainly looking forward to learning about your story. Pretty much here on the Mentors Like Podcast, we really like to get to know our guest mentors a little better. So would you mind sharing something with us that most people don't know about you? Uh, yeah. So when someone sees me, uh, they'll realize I'm six foot seven. And <laughs> their first question is going to be like, do you play basketball? And I did, but it wasn't where I spent a lot of my time. I actually used to be a very avid bowler. <laughs> um, I, I'm serious. I uh, I carried a 187 average. My wow. highest game is 275. Like I had my own ball, shoes, bag, everything. Like I was wow, serious. You legit. <laughs> yeah, I used to be very, very like I was in a bowling league. Like it was a big part of my life at one point. So is it an advantage being that tall as a bowler? Uh, no, <laughs> actually, it works against you, which is why okay. I used to be an avid bowler. Uh, because <laughs> you know, there's a lot of torque. And twisting mm-hmm. that goes with bowl- with bowling, okay. and so at my height, it's even more torque, which is bad on your body over time. Uh, um, yeah, so gotcha. eventually I had to stop bowling just because it was bad on like my hips and okay. my hips fine because of you know just curving the ball. Right, right. So, so it actually works against you to be this. <laughs> but I love uh, it. But that's cool. Yeah, I know. Imagine how often you get the basketball question. But I'm sure no one ever walked up to you and said, Ax, are you a bowler? Yeah, it has <laughs> never come up, and I doubt it ever will. <laughs> that's cool. Well, Larry, here on the Mentor Select Podcast, we really encourage our listeners to follow their passion and ultimately discover their purpose. Can you mm-hmm. tell us how you're following your passion? Yeah, so a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in the church. My, okay. my dad, he's Larry Hawkins Sr. I'm Larry Hawkins II. So I'm named okay. after him. He's been a pastor my entire life. So I grew up watching him lead a church, lead a community, and, you know, help people become more spiritually healthy and also helping the community to help heal them in the different ways they need to be healed. And so watching him in a very people-focused uh, capacity really shaped the way that I looked at how I engage people. 
So I was always looking for ways to give back and to help other people, whether it be like as a tutor, because I was you know, really good in math and science, or whether just being a listening ear for people. So I realized early on I had a passion for helping people. Okay. Uh, and so that kind of dictated how I approached going to high school, going to college, eventually choosing where I would, would go for college, I mean, for you know, employment, and then the founding of my business. It was always starting with people development fo- first, and then everything else will come after that. Okay. But just realizing early on, like what I enjoyed doing uh, kind of set the tone for everything else. Wow, that's great. So what do you do now? I am the CEO of Hawkins Development Group. We're a consulting group where we focus on helping people find self-fulfillment, whether it be through personal, interpersonal, organizational development. So we do a lot of work with employee development for companies. And then we also do strategic planning to help organizations like set their vision, set their mission, set their values. And as an organization, how do we you know, take care of our people, but also make a difference? Uh, and so I get a chance to travel around. Uh, I've gone as far as Costa Rica before. Wow. Uh, last week I was in New York. So I've got a chance to do a, a bit of traveling uh, to help different types of organizations, whether it be nonprofit, um, corporate, government, or academic. Those are kind of the four main industries that we work in. Wow, that's cool. So what you major in? Is, is that something you majored in in college? Uh, so <laughs> it's always a, a funny point of conversation because I got a degree in electrical engineering. Okay. <laughs> because also, in addition to being passionate about people, I was also passionate about electronics, uh, okay. specifically how things work. So gotcha. I was that kid who would take, you know, devices apart and then put them back together because my parents realized, you know, my natural inclinations, they bought me like handheld games. Like here, play with this, take this apart, put this back <laughs> together, but don't touch the TV. The don't electronics, touch the yeah. like, So they set boundaries, but they still allowed me to, to explore. Explore, that's um, awesome. And so along my journey, I was like, okay, one day I want to own my, my own computer business. What that would look like, I wasn't sure, but I just knew that I like computers. Yeah. Uh, so I eventually, I started majoring in computer engineering, but then I realized with computer engineering, you have to do a lot of programming behind the computer in a lab. Okay. It was taking me away from interacting with people because again, you know, I love helping people. So right. I wanted to find something that was in the computer realm, but allowed me more flexibility to also engage people, which is why I switched to electrical engineering. Uh, okay. That, that ironically enough, going to electrical engineering aligned with where I eventually went to go work, which was National Instruments out here in Austin, Texas, where they do engineering work, but it's very people focused. So they have an engineering leadership program where you get a chance to hone your leadership skills while also honing your engineering skills. Wow. That's cool. It's ironic now that you you folks are helping people find their self-fulfillment, their purpose and passion. So essentially... Yeah. I always tell people, you know, I major in electrical engineering, but now I major in people engineering. Exactly. You know, exactly. I help people, you know, out how people out. work. <laughs> exactly. You know, how what makes them tick, how to make them become the best version of themselves. Right. And that's where I operate now. Exciting. It definitely beats being stuck in a cubicle programming. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I always say, people ask me, you know, if you could go back, would you major in like psychology or something? And I always say no, okay. because going through the engineering curriculum trained me how to think. It helped me look at complex issues and then simplify it to a root cause. And that's the same thing I do now in the work that I do is I, people are complex individuals, organizations are complex organizations. So being able to take all these complexities and then simplify it into, okay, here's what we need to do first. Here's what we need to do second and help them move it towards, you know, an end goal is because I learned how to think like an engineer. Yeah. That's a valuable skill. (laughs) Certainly. Definitely valuable. All right. So where'd you grow up at? Uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. It's on the Mississippi okay. Gulf Coast. If you're okay. traveling east on I-10, it's the last town before you cross into Alabama. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those towns where you're driving on the highway and you see a sign that says Pascagoula, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And you think for a second, I wonder what's there. And then you keep driving. Uh, <laughs> you don't so, stop. You just wonder. Yeah, huh? That's why you just keep driving. But I, I love it. I tell everybody where I, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be from Pascagoula. So what was it like growing up there? So growing up in Pascagoula, well, one thing is it's big on seafood, okay. uh, Mardi Gras, <laughs> and um, knowing your neighbor. It's kind of okay. how I would sum it up. Okay. Being over on the Gulf Coast, the entire Gulf Coast was all, always passionate about seafood, always passionate about Mardi Gras. Uh, but the importance of knowing your neighbor 
and getting a chance to learn from people who may not, you know, grow up the same way you did Mm -hmm. was a a really good part of, you know, growing past school. So one thing I really liked was my parents, they had us attend the local boys and girls club. Got a chance to, you know, engage with other, you know, youth that were in our similar demographic, but a different background in terms of like parental structure, you know, in terms of, you know, outside of school, get Mm -hmm. a chance to kind of learn from people who aren't like you. Right. It will help you be more tolerant and understanding and be able to engage someone who may be coming from a different angle than you are. Right. Right. Yeah. Those valuable lessons. How would you say those lessons served you in your professional career? Um, I wouldn't be where I am now mm-hmm. without it <laughs> yeah. because I spend more time talking and getting to know someone who we don't share very much in common at all than I do working with people who we do share a lot in common. And I think it's just because the nature of my business is we're all about helping people find purpose. And purpose doesn't have a set age limit. It doesn't have a set race. It doesn't have a set religion. You know, it's independent of all of that. And so because of it being so, you, you know, unique to each person, you get a chance to engage each person in a different way, you know, be able to relate, relate to them in a different way. And all of those, skills started out you know from back home you built that great foundation certainly. yeah absolutely awesome so all right so you graduated from college with your degree in electrical engineering mm-hmm. you would say you went to work for national systems uh, national instruments national instruments gotcha yeah. all right and then how did you transition into what you're doing now well, <laughs> about that transition <laughs> yeah so it's funny it happened really organic like in hindsight it's like oh of course that happened but at the <laughs> time you know you don't really see things unfolding the way they do um, but when I worked for National Instruments, they have a program called Engineering Leadership Program. Okay. It's an 18 to 36 month transitional program where it's you and everybody else is basically fresh out of college. So it's college 2.0. Uh, okay. We've got a, a floor of 150 young engineers, you know, excited about learning about the products, learning about the company, but then also learning about ourselves. You know, you can aspire to be a mentor or a team leader or a team manager. So there's a lot of things the system is set up to help you you know find your own path okay. you're expected to eventually move on to another department in the company you know and grow your career well i joined there june 2011 and after being there for five months i became a team leader so i was in charge of 16 of my peers across this department of 150 other engineers and the team that i inherited was last in all key metrics across the entire department okay Not only the last in metric they were also very low on morale well, yeah, some work to do. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I'm inheriting this team, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, if I'm passionate about leadership, I can't just say, all right, well, we're just going to keep the status quo and mm-hmm. keep moving. Like, I've got to find a way to get them more excited, more engaged. And so I created what was the a one-hour version of what eventually became, you know, our foundational class about self-branding. Uh, but okay. from the aspect of finding your purpose and then building your career around your passions and not just a specific skill. Okay. Because, you know, when you think about personal branding, you think about like, oh, I have these skills. Let me make sure I brand these skills, you know, appropriately so people can know, hey, I'm good at this. Mm-hmm. Whereas we approach it from, okay, you know, what excites you? You know, what are you passionate about? Where do you see yourself going? And then how do we start setting that foundation now to get you to where you want to go? So we, we developed a brand for the team. We developed brands for each individual. We came up with, you know, development plans. Everybody had their own version of leadership. We had different teams within the team give everybody a chance to, you know, be bought into the vision. Well, five months later, we went from last in all metrics to either first or second in all metrics. Wow. And management came to me and said, Larry, what did you do? It was working. (laughs) So I got a chance to start teaching across the rest of the department. And we were just doing, you know, sessions. And then other departments in the company started to hear about it. So I started teaching it to other departments. And then I got a chance to teach it company-wide during the Employee Appreciation Week. Well, okay. you know, that session was a hit. And so the learning and development manager came to me and said, hey, we want to make this a formal you know, company offering. Can wow. you expand this to a full workshop? And I was like, yeah, sure. Because again, I'm just doing this because I love to do it. Yeah. Well, along the way, one of my now business partners came to me and said, hey, you know, you can make a business out of this. And, you know, again, I had when I was younger, I had the idea of I'm going to have my own computer business. Okay. I never thought about making a business out of this because A, you know, I'm passionate about it. And right. then B, I'm just doing it because I love it. Not so I want somebody to pay me, but she was like, you know, you could get people to pay you to do this. 
I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So then I started teaching it more, and you know, it starts to really resonate and help people, you mm-hmm. know, start to redirect their career. I'm like seeing those results. Right. Like I'm seeing I'm, I'm actually making a difference. So then I go back, I go back to her. Her name's Travis Sand. I say, okay, hey, let's sit down and talk about you know what that will look like. So me and her sat down, she brought in Paul, another one of our, our now business partners, and we, we started brainstorming and we came up with you know Hawkins Development Group. Like, okay, so people would potentially pay me to do this. Cool. So we start the business, and I always tell people, you know, when you're starting out, you're not a real business until someone pays you for your services. <laughs> right. And so, you know, our first client ended up being um, Leander School District, which is a school district that's local here. Okay. They brought me in to do two one-hour sessions for their juniors and seniors for their a leadership, you know, class or event they were having. Gotcha. I, just, I just did two one-hour sessions. They paid me six hundred dollars for two hours of work. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, they're <laughs> paying me to do something I love to do." <laughs> the light bulb. Like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and so and that was kind of the foundation. It was a very organic thing where it just you know I started with I wanted to help my team. I wanted to help the department. I wanted to help other departments. And ultimately, you know, it, it just was born out of me wanting to help people identify, you know, what does purpose look like for you? And then yeah. how you start making the steps to get there. Right. Awesome. And yeah, that's a valuable lesson for the listeners in terms of say they're working in a job where it's, it's just so many opportunities that you can maximize while you're in that job yes. that can potentially be that launching point for your own business. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a prime example of how to do that. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because, you know, when I first started teaching this, my core audience was other engineers. Right. If you've ever met an engineer, engineers are very particular in how they approach things. They want like, I need a system. I need steps. If yeah. I don't like this, I, I poke holes. Very structured. They're yeah. very, you know, very structured, very strong willed. And so engaging this population with something like the concept of purpose, I had to get really intentional intentional about the way I created, you know, a framework for, okay, here's how you apply this in this situation. Here's the mm-hmm. format for this. Like it had to be very tangible and tactical. Yeah. So yeah. it forced me to take, yeah, measurable. So you got, right. Yeah. It forced me to take a very intangible concept such as purpose and make it tangible and tactical and approachable for anybody, regardless wow. of where you're coming from. So wow. it, was a, it was a good challenge. And a lot of iterations came out of that. Because it was, you know, the population that I was originally teaching it to. Definitely. Yeah, that, that's a tough audience to start with. So if you, if you can get that proof of concept with engineers, you know. Exactly. Like if you can convince an engineer to buy in, yeah. then you're, 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 <laughs> you're on to something. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty great. And I love the fact we talked about with self-branding. One of the first questions you ask the whole purpose is like, what excites you? How important is that as far as being excited about what you're doing? When I look at the idea of like, pursuing your passions, I always start with defining what is a passion. And I define passion as an intersection between activities you're good at doing and activities you enjoy doing. Because if you have an activity that you're good at doing, but you don't enjoy doing it, it's a chore. Gotcha. Yeah. But if it's an activity that you're not good at doing, and but you enjoy doing it, it's a hobby. Whereas an activity that you're not good at doing and you don't enjoy doing, that's pain. Right. But passions are the intersection of activities that you enjoy doing and activities that you're good at doing. Okay. So if you can start to find things where like, I have a natural talent for this and I don't have a talent for it, it actually brings me happiness. It brings me joy. I look for ways to do more of it. Mm. That's what passion is. And so when you're trying to pursue passion, you know, that's what you want to look for. And it's not just, you know, the here and now, you can look across, you know, your history, like what I did in college, what did I do when I was young, yeah. what did I do because somebody made me and then I realized, oh, I actually like doing this. Right. Like, if you start looking for those types of activities, eventually, I always talk about, I always tell people that passions are a symptom of purpose, because if you can find the common thread between all your passions, then you can start to identify what purpose looks like for you. But it starts with that first step of identifying, you know, what is something that I'm good at doing and something that I enjoy doing. Both those criteria, it has the potential to be a passion. Love it. <laughs> yeah, it's down to the science for sure. I've, I've had a lot of time and a lot of, I've helped a lot of people and I've had a chance to kind of hone, hone in on this final answer. Like, how do you define passion? How do you define yeah. purpose? Uh, yeah. Being that this is what I do day in and day out, uh, I've got a chance to kind of really dig deep into this. 
Okay, gotcha. So you mentioned that you do this day in, day out. Are you because st- originally when you first started your company, were you work- still working your job? Yes. Uh, so for we founded Hawkins Development Group January first, twenty fourteen. Okay. Um, we started the planning process of summer summer twenty thirteen, but we the official LLC was filed January first, twenty fourteen. I worked full time in National Instruments and full time with Hawkins Development Group from January first, twenty fourteen until November first, twenty seventeen. So almost four years, I was doing both. And what that looked like was anytime I had to travel to teach a workshop for the business, I would take a vacation day from National Instruments. I was very open with my managers, like, hey, you know, I do this on the side. There was no conflict of interest with, you know, what I was doing with National Instruments because I was working and learning and development. And the understanding was anything I create for National Instruments stays with National Instruments. And so I was like, okay, that's not a problem. And that group, Hawkins Development Group, says Hawkins Development Group. Okay. So anytime that I would travel to go do a workshop, I'd take a vacation day. Mm-hmm. That meant that I didn't really have a lot of vacation days to take <laughs> actual vacations. Right. Um, I am eternally thankful for my wife because she was very understanding during, during this stage because, like, I would work a full eight-hour day at National Instruments then come home, and I'd be up till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning working on stuff for Hawkins Development Group, and then I'd go to sleep, wake up, repeat. Do it all over again, um, yeah. Yeah, I was burning the candle at both ends, but mm-hmm. it was worth it because, okay. you know, I was doing things that I was passionate about. I had a, a long-term goal of what I was moving towards because I knew with the business, because I'm the primary facilitator, it can only grow as far as I have available time. So I knew that at some point for the business to really take off, I've got to free up my time. Okay. So then that meant, I think we started probably... January of 2015, we set a goal that any income that we brought in, we were saving it. We weren't reinvesting back into the business. We were just putting it into the account. And the goal was that when I leave, for us to have salary to give me a runway to focus fully on the business. Wow. We started that January 2015, and we didn't have a a deadline for, okay, I'm going to leave at this date. It was more of, you know, we have financial stability with my full-time job. So let me leverage that financial stability to know that my bills are paid. <laughs> we have health insurance. We're not yeah. going to lose our house. With the necessities. <laughs> right. Like the, the bare necessity to take care of. And then the rest of it, I know I'm working towards a one day, whenever that day is going to come, I'm going to give this a full-time shot. All right. Cool. So yeah. you've been full-time since 2017 now? Yeah. November 1st, 2017 was okay. my official last day at Hawkins, I mean, National Instruments and okay. my official first day at Hawkins Development Group. All right. Cool. So how's it going? <laughs> if you had asked me this question this time last year, I would have told you I have no clue. <laughs> um, it, it's funny because when I left November 1st, 2017, it's like, all right, I'm a full-time you know, entrepreneur. <laughs> what do I do now? Now what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I started, you know, trying to find networking groups and trying to send emails. I even, you know, I set up meetings with a lot of people who were key, you know, to my journey to that point. Sit down like, hey, you know, just letting you know I'm going full time. You know, if you have any opportunities in the future, you know, anybody who, you know, may be interested, feel free to connect us because I'm giving this my all. You know, that was one of the first things I did. So, yeah, I think it's a good move. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Like I'm I'm trying to, you know, I'm letting it be known that, hey, you know, doing this, you know, full focus. Because of the timing of when I left NI, National Instruments, it was right when the holiday season was starting. Yeah. And so and there was a point to where it was just quiet because yeah. people were taking, you know. Everybody in holiday mode. Yeah. yeah everybody's, everybody's not worried about work. Like, I'm just trying to make it to Christmas <laughs> break. Right. Yeah. Um, and that part, you know, that time frame was really rough for me. Okay. Because I was like, okay, I'm sending emails. Nobody's getting back to me. I'm not finding a lot of you know value in the networking groups I'm getting into. Mm-hmm. What do I do now? Yeah. Um, and that's actually when I sat down to write my book. I had been wanting to write this book for like four years. Mm-hmm. And I had the first line of the book back in October of 2014. The first line of the book came to me. And so I, I recorded it in my inbox. And so I, I still have the draft of mm-hmm. you know, that first line. But mm-hmm. That was it. Like nothing else came to me. And so I was like, okay, I've got to figure out, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to write this book. Every time I sit down to write the book, I'd have writer's block. So (laughs) apparently it's not time. Well, then fast forward to, we're looking at December, 2017, where everything is quiet. So, okay, well, 
I have anything but time now. Yeah. So let's, you know, start writing and we'll just see where inspiration takes me. I'll reevaluate by the end of the month and mm -hmm. then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, December 10th, I sat down to start writing. And for the next four to five days, all I did was I wrote, I ate, I slept, and I went to the gym. Mm -hmm. That was all I did because, again, I'm, I'm, I have free time now. Yeah. Um, and so inspiration just kept coming and kept coming. I'm just writing and writing and writing. I still remember there were nights where I'm sitting on the couch next to my wife. She's watching, you know, Netflix. and I'm just typing away on my laptop. Right. In the zone. The 14th rolls around and I realize I'm done. Mm. Like the framework that I had, I fully fleshed it out. I touched on all my topics. It's like, oh, OK, cool. I'm done. Well, I guess I should get it published now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I reached out to a friend of mine who had recently published her own book. She got me in contact with her editors. I knew a graphic designer from my working with uh, Hawkins Development Group. So I reached out to my graphic designer, like, hey, here's my vision. Um, and I set a very ambitious goal of I want to launch the book January 5th, uh, 15th. So okay. that's the month. Yeah. So we do all the editing. It's aggressive. <laughs> yeah. It was, so in retrospect, uh, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, that, that was the hardest month worth of time that I have in recent memory. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, working with the editors, you know, you write up first draft of the book, like, okay, it's perfect. You yeah. send it to the editors and they send it back with, here's all the things that's wrong with it. Yeah. Um, and I, I love my editors, the, the poised professionals. They're, they're absolutely one of the two sisters who own their own, you know, editing group. Uh -huh. Awesome. Um, but they, we worked, you know, I set the ambitious goal. They said, okay, we can meet this. So we're working back and forth. We're working through Christmas holidays, like wow. Christmas Eve. Uh, dedicated. I'm, yeah, like Christmas Eve, I'm working on the draft, sending it to them. Christmas wow. Day, they're doing their revisions, sending it back to me. Like we were cranking it out. Yeah. And um, we met the deadline of January 15th. Okay, oh. Wow. Yeah, I was shocked myself. That's impressive. <laughs> but, you know, I wrote the book to help other people to help okay. you figure out, you know, what does purpose look like for you? Because the title Before is- Before you get into that, what's the name of your book? Yeah, so the title is Five Principles to a Purposeful Life. Um, how to move with purpose and start making a difference. That's, that's the, you know, the subtitle of it. And so what I did is I took my five personal life principles and wrote the book around that. So the, you know, how those principles came to be, how they played a role in my life, you know, what I learned from it, the mistakes that I made along the way. You know, I was very transparent throughout the entire book. But, you know, here are my five principles. Here's how you can apply them. You know, take them and do with them what you will. Okay. So I knew that, you know, January is a time where people are looking to make a change. Self-help self season. <laughs> yeah. So like, I've got to launch this in January, which is why I set that, that deadline. Gotcha. So, you know, we launched it. And, you know, my goal was if I can sell 75 copies, that'll be a success. Okay. Um, we ended up having, I think pre-orders were around like 150 pre-orders. And as the year went on, I think by the end of the year, sold over a thousand books, wow. which was beyond anything I ever foresaw. Yeah. Um, but the cool part is that by writing that book, it kind of launch padded me into this entrepreneurship path. Okay. Got on this very topic. Like I, I wasn't sure what the new year was going to look like, but mm -hmm. by releasing the book, getting in the hands of different people, it opened doors for me that okay. I didn't even know need to be open. So all of last year was kind of, you know, fumbling through, finding my way, uh, you know, trying things, getting rejected, having things come out of nowhere, like, oh, hey, come do, you know, come give this speech or come talk to this organization. Yeah. Oh, we found your book. We want to talk to you more about it. And so it's like, it was a really cool way of, again, very organic, very, I'm not sure where I'm going, but I'm just going to trust in my path, you know, trust that, you know, purpose led me here. So it's not going to bring me to this point and leave me. Uh, so, I, you know, I've got to remain just faithful to the, to the journey. And all of last year was very foundation setting all over again. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, I've been doing this in 2014. This is the <laughs> first year where I'm doing it like full on. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was very foundation setting. We had a couple, you know, big opportunities come through that helped us, you know, fund because our biggest expense at the time was my salary. Gotcha. So we just, we're just trying to live, we're living month to month. Like, all right, we just hope something comes through is going to get us another month of salary. Yeah. Um, but the foundation that we set last year set us up very strongly coming into this year, where at this point, you know, we have more clients, 
you know, more contracts, more opportunities Mm -hmm. at this time than any other time in the business. So, you know, now I say things are going great, but if you asked me this time last year, I was like, you know what? I'm just taking it one day at a time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of the process, definitely. Yeah, certainly. Like that's like a mean. farmer, you was planting those seeds. Yes, yes. <laughs> that and, and that's a really good um analogy that I always try to make people mindful of when you're looking at like pursuing passion and pursuing purpose. Mm-hmm. Is that you know if you want to build something that lasts, think of an oak tree. Like an oak tree doesn't sprout overnight. Yeah. You know, it, it takes a long time to get to that monstrous, you know, tree that you see is hundreds of years. It takes yeah. time. Whereas if you're looking for that quick fix, mushrooms, you know, they sprout, <laughs> and they, they die in the same day. So if, if you want to build something that lasts, you have to take a long term view. You yeah. can't just, you know, think, OK, well, how can I get the next quick hit? And, you know, and, yeah. and keep moving because that's not sustainable. Yeah, are you in for the long game or the short game? Exactly. I, I like that analogy. So the mushroom, you yeah. want to be a mushroom or do you want to be oak tree? Which that's what it comes down to. Which one do you want to be? <laughs> wow, that's cool. I like it. So where can people get your book? Oh, so it's on Amazon. Oh, um, Amazon, okay. qualifies for Amazon Prime, so two-day shipping. It's $14.99. Awesome. Um, I typically, you know, direct people directly to Amazon now just because Whenever we first launched it, I launched it through my website. Like it was on Amazon, but I was teach- sending everybody to the website, right. which is www.hogdg.com. But by people buying it through the website, I was doing all the packaging. I was doing all the shipping. You know, yeah. I was autographing all the books, which was very time consuming, but gotcha. I had to the time. So it wasn't okay. a problem. Right. Because now I'm traveling, you know, yeah. a couple of times each month and different things come up. So I want to make sure people get their books on time. So I always say, you know, go to Amazon. It's on. It's a oh, Amazon Kindle also, um, so you can get it. You know, either one of those two places. Awesome, cool. So, what advice would you give someone who's considering writing a book who feel like they have a story on their heart? What, would you, what advice would you give them? Um, the first thing I would say is to start with an outline. Don't just sit down and just start trying to like write the book. Write an outline. So kind of like, what are the key takeaways that this has to be in the book? Like this has to be like, this is key to the story. It's key to the lessons learned. Like what are those moments? Um, I would also say find people who you trust Mm -hmm. to read passages of it as you write it to get their no opinions. And then also find people who you don't know as well, but they're still trustworthy who may not okay. be as familiar with your story, have them read it too. Um, okay. They'll give you a perspective that you don't have because writing a book, uh, I'm not a parent, so I can't say this with full accuracy, but mm-hmm. writing a book is a, like, you know, having a child in a way because yeah. it's giving your heart Maybe. and your soul yeah. to this. So invested in it. Right, you're so invested. And so in your eyes, it can do no wrong. Yeah, like this is the best book of all time. And so you'll miss typos, you'll miss discrepancies in the story, you'll miss the gaps, everything. gaps and differences in your writing style, difference in the tense that you're. So have people who can give you know an outside perspective on it. Mm-hmm. Um, the last piece of advice I would give is it's not easy. It's a, it's an extremely hard thing, but mm-hmm. remain faithful to why you wanted to write this book, like. You want to think about what what gave me the first notion that I should write this book. Right. Is it like a certain type of demographic, certain type of people, certain certain type of lifestyle that I've lived this, I want them to learn from me. If that's who you're writing it for, write it for them. Okay. Don't try to write it for everyone. Gotcha. Because if you write it for everyone, it's going to dilute your story. Yeah. And the most powerful thing you have is your story. It's you. There's mm-hmm. only one you. So remain, you know, true to that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. So when you're writing your book, who did you have in mind as far as a reader? So I always thought back to that one individual. I met someone who they were unhappy with, you know, their job. Mm-hmm. They were unhappy with the direction of their life. They didn't really feel motivated to get up each day and go to work. They're just like, I'm just going through the motions. Yeah. And it was because they had never stepped back and asked themselves, you know, what do I want? It was okay. always, 
you know, my friends need this from me. My boss needs this from me. My kids need this. Like it's always giving to other people and they're never taking a moment to ask themselves, what do I want? Okay. And so when I was writing the book, I was always thinking about that person who was unmotivated because they never took a moment to get in touch with, you know, what excites them. And so I, that's who I originally wrote the book for. As I started to do going through the editing process, I realized there are parts of my story that really resonated with, okay, I know what I want to do, but how do I get there? And so like, how do I connect, you know, point A to point B? And so there were elements of the book that I combined to, you know, include it. Not only, okay, I don't know where, how I'm motivated, but now that I know how I'm motivated, what's my next step? And so that's, that, you know, that's the, the two types of people that I kept in my mind because those are the two types of people that I helped the most as I was building my business. It was people who either didn't know what they wanted or they knew what they wanted, but they don't know how to start navigating there now. Wow. And so like, how do, how do they, you know, get the tools, how do they take the steps, how do they connect to the right people to start down that path? Uh, that's who I really kept in mind as I was writing the book. Awesome. And I think what's also incredible about your story and your experience is a big thing that differentiates you from most, say, motivational speakers, trainers, things like that is you, you connect those two. You're telling them, okay, help them find it. Okay, now what? You're connecting yeah. and giving them the steps. It's not just, okay, good luck. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, and I, I attribute that again to my engineering. You know, yeah, big time. Yeah, that's, it's so obvious how, <laughs> how integral engineering is. Yeah. Like, so right now you're, you're people engineering. So, yes. yeah. Yes. Pretty yeah. awesome. And I absolutely love it. But it's like, again, when I tell people about pursuing purpose, every part of your journey is part of that pursuit of purpose. Even yeah. when you don't even know that you're on the, the path to purpose, your journey is walking, you know, it's working its way there anyway. Right. So as you're starting to take those, answer those questions of, okay, what do I want? The answers are in your past. It's in your journey. So yeah. you know, mind your journey, you know, for those, for those gems, for those answers to mm -hmm. give you a direction of, okay, where do I go from here? Because every part of it is important whenever you're trying to figure out what's next. Big time, big time. Cool. Well, yeah, since this podcast, we focus a lot on mentorship. Mm -hmm. what, how have mentors played a role in your, your success? Oh, absolutely. Um, so my very first mentor was my father, or is my father, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, he always set the expectation I don't even know what age he told me this, but it's something that's always been ingrained with me that he doesn't want me to be a chip off the old block. Okay. He wants me to be a better man than him. That's what he's always, you know, harped on, you know, throughout, you know, my, my path. And he was very open about sharing not only his strengths, but his weaknesses, you know, where he stumbled, how, you know, I can learn from what he's done so I don't make those same mistakes. Okay. So my very first mentor, he like he shaped what mentorship should look like for me. He also said that in every environment you go into, if you're the smartest person in the room, change rooms. Okay. Um, and so that also inspired me to always look for people who are further along the path than I am. So yeah. when I went to you know high school, I'm looking for like a high school senior who's somebody who's further along the path that can you know I can learn from, who I can talk to, who I can engage, who I can bounce questions off of. You know, when I went to college the same way, you know, who's somebody who's been there for a couple of years that I could, you know, use like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Do you know anybody? What, you know, what's your advice? Um, when I went to National Instruments, I was me looking for, okay, you know, who's someone that is further along the path, whether it be a, a manager or the department manager. Yeah. Um, I'm always looking for someone who's further along. And okay. entrepreneurship is no different because, yeah. you know, while what I do is unique to me, it's similar enough to a few other people of what they do that I can, you know, ask them like, Hey, so I'm thinking about running into this problem. Have you seen this? You know, what would you do? What's your advice? That kind of thing. But mentors, I, I cannot recall a point in my life where I didn't have a mentor in some wow. capacity yeah. because I've under, I understand how invaluable it is to learn from someone else's experience to hopefully save you from having to make the same mistakes. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I always say if you want to know the road ahead, hey, ask someone coming back. Yeah, uh, exactly. I remember when I first heard that quote, but yeah, it's, it's so true. Someone's already been down that path you're going. Yeah. They have the answers. Just ask them. <laughs> yeah, certainly. And I want to personally thank you. You've, you've been a mentor to me. We've met 
Uh, probably less than a month now, but you certainly give me a lot of share a lot of your experiences, being transparent, and just share a lot of resources that has helped me avoid a lot of pitfalls and just help kind of speed up my my learning curves. I'm glad, I'm glad to do that. Yeah, and, see, and and that's the other part of the quote that often gets looked over is if you're the smartest person in the room, change rooms. But once you learn it, go back in that room and disseminate the information. So I always try to look for ways that I can give back to hopefully save other people, you know, from some of the pain points I ran into. So I'm just happy that I, that we were able to connect. I was able to kind of, you know, share, yeah. you know, like here's a treasure trove of things that I've done. <laughs> so you don't have to do it too. Uh, so I'm glad it was, it was useful. Right. Cause yeah, it's, it's a huge learning curve when you, as an entrepreneur and doing anything new, but especially as entrepreneurs, it's a lot to learn. Cause Absolutely. More from an employee you're used to doing, focusing on one thing, your job, but yeah, yeah business is it, it comprises a lot of different departments, different functions. Yes, so. yes, you're you're kind of the you're wearing the mini hats. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sometimes all at the same time, so you get <laughs> you get yeah, big, a lot of different ways. A big time, big time. So we talked a lot about purpose, passion, all that good stuff. Um, I guess as we get ready to wrap up this interview, what would be some of your, your parting words of advice to the listeners? Um, one thing that I would definitely emphasize is be kind to yourself. And what I mean by that is you look at, okay, I'm doing you know my job that I don't love, but it pays the bills mm-hmm. versus something that I'm passionate about. And we get into the mindset of it's either or. You have to do one or the other. And that's not the case. Um, you can definitely do both as long as you do both with intention. Okay. Because, you know, like I said, I was working full time and building Hawk DG, you know, full time for roughly three years. But everything was done with intention where I knew that, OK, if we go after this business. If you get this business, this money is going here. If I'm building this content, I'm building with the int- intention of, of doing that. If I'm going through training at work. I'm making sure it's valuable for what I do at my job, but also valuable for what I'm doing over here because, yeah. you know, it, again, everything is done with intention. Yeah. And when I say be kind to yourself, when I say be kind to yourself, I mean that understand that it's not an overnight process. Yeah. The pursuit of purpose, I say, is a series of inflection points. It's not just a switch that happens. <laughs> it's key moments that further propel you forward, but they don't happen all at once. Yeah. And so those moments where you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm failing. I'm still stuck in this job that I hate. I can't do this thing. I want to, I want to, you know, I love to do be kind to yourself because yeah. it's a journey. Yeah. Again, it's that oak tree versus the mushroom. Like, yeah. yeah, you could very well leave your job today and go do this thing you're passionate about. And it could work out well. It could also not. Right. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're going to make that leap, do it with a plan. Yeah, intentional intention you you've got to you got to be kind to yourself and you've got to be intentional and that's in everything that you do it's great advice awesome awesome so larry how can people get in contact with you uh yeah so you can find our website is www.hawkdg.com um, okay office development group is hawk dg uh i'm on facebook linkedin instagram at larry underscore hawk dg twitter at underscore mr hawk yeah i'm on all normal social media but you can see uh, some videos on YouTube of me presenting and touching on different topics. Um, just look for Larry Hawkins the second YouTube. Yeah, I think. And you can email me directly at Larry at HawkDG.com if you have any questions. Uh, I reply as soon as I can. But, you know, those are kind of the key ways that if you're looking to get in contact with me, that's how you can do it. Yeah, and I can vouch. He'll definitely respond to you and, and help you out if he can. So. Yeah, even if it's, hey, I can't reply right now, but I will on this date. Mm-hmm. I will definitely get back to you. Awesome. Awesome. And you say your book can be found on Amazon? Yes. Five Principles to a Purposeful Life, uh, available on Amazon and Amazon Kindle. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure I pick up a copy. And next time you're in Dallas or I'm in Houston, make sure I get it signed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, and I'm sure I'll likely see you this summer. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Awesome. But well, we appreciate it. Larry, you definitely shared a lot of great uh, inspirational guidance with us and wisdom and you know, a, a great story. So. Certainly looking forward, wishing you the best, continued success. I know you appreciate got. that. And, and definitely keep me up to date as things progress for you. And I'm here to help yes. however I can. They definitely appreciate it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Wow. That was a value packed interview with Larry Hawkins. 
He gave us so much actionable guidance that you could take today. And certainly if you're someone who is unfulfilled in your career or you just don't know where you're going in life as far as finding your purpose, he is the man to contact. He knows people engineering inside out and he's all about helping others find fulfillment in life. So certainly reach out to Larry. Also check out his book on Amazon. I'll include his contact information and the link to his book in the show notes. But yeah, we just can't thank Larry enough and take him up on his offer. He said they give you his direct email. He will uh, respond to you. He helped me out a lot. And I just first time I reached out to him, he gave me just a, a great wealth of resources in his time. So can't thank him enough. So that's a, a great resource for you all as well. So reach out to him and be sure to check out his book and let him know what resonated with you about this interview. Other than that, we'll be back next week with another interview from another one of our phenomenal guest mentors. So tune in. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Mentor Select Podcast, helping you identify and follow your passions. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit MentorSelect.com and MentorSelect on social media. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review. We'll catch you next time.